Realm Presents Dark Heights Episode 2 Tess You have incredible hair, Lina said, and she actually took a length of my hair into both hands and pressed it against her mouth as if she was kissing it, inhaling the scent of it. This, of course, jerked my head sideways as I was driving and made me crank the wheel to the right, almost crashing us into the cars parked along beach out front of Kelman's hardware store. Oh, sorry, she said, releasing my head. That was impulsive. It was a little unexpected, I said. I was actually beginning to feel like I'd allowed some kind of undomesticated and unpredictable stray animal into the car. I said half-heartedly, Your hair is pretty. Then I looked over at her. Her hair was still wild after the altercation with the boys, and, to be honest, she mostly just looked crazy. I'm average, she said. I work with it, but you've got such long, straight hair, and it's the most intense black color, so it's just beautiful. I love it. Um, thanks, I said. This rescue I'd initiated was continuing to be awkward in so many different ways. Her aggressive boyfriend and his friend, Dylan and Zach, had left us at the side of the road, had left her, and so I had offered to give her a ride home. I still didn't know who she was, not that she was a severand who lived at Arson, but we introduced ourselves, I'm Tess, I'm Lina, before we got into my car. I asked where home was for her, and she said Summit, I was surprised, since I'd incorrectly assumed, what with her homemade-looking, or at least second-hand dress, that she was a kind of Molly Ringwald from Pretty in Pink, a basically plain girl from the poor part of town. Not that there was really such a thing in Park Heights. There were some trailers out on Amarana Street toward Topanga State Park, but hippies lived in those in a kind of commune, I think and that she was making a move to rise above her social status, having snagged the attention of the Andrew McCarthy in this version, Dylan, a rich kid slumming it for a cheap date. I guess in that movie they fall in love, but reality is usually quite different. You should wear darker makeup, Lina continued. I would, all the time. Lina flipped down the passenger side sun visor and looked at herself in the tiny mirror as if to confirm that she was in fact dolled up with overdone dark eyeliner and mascara, dark red lipstick. Well, I guess I am, she admitted, at the moment, but it would suit you better. You're far too good looking to just kind of go around as low key as you are right now. I was just coming home from work. Not sure my boss would want me to be all queen of the goths for my shifts. I thought about this. She probably wouldn't care, actually, but I shrugged. It's not me, really. You prefer to be ordinary. Ordinary? I echoed, pretending to be taking offense. I said you were good-looking just a second ago. You know what I mean, she said irritably. I laughed. Don't be so easy to tease. Oh, she said, and then sighed deeply. I've been told I don't do well with jokes at my expense. Well, what I want to know, I said, negotiating one of the hairpin switchbacks on beach as it ascended the hillside, is what you're going to do with your mean boyfriend Dylan, and what I'm really asking is, in case you're not catching the subtext, are you going to break up with him? Like, right now? He's not my boyfriend, she said. I'm pretty sure he doesn't know that. That's his problem. How did you meet him? He goes to school with my brother. She looked at me. Do you think Dylan's attractive? Not really, no. I almost said that Dylan's friend was better looking, but I held that back, because did I really think Zach, a high school kid, was hot? That was weird. Maybe I had spent too long with my love life shut down the way it was, but that's how I'd wanted things since I came back to Park Heights. Mrs. Markova, my favorite Russian lady, had just been telling me the other day that I needed some romance in my life. Also, I didn't actually know if Zach and Dylan were in high school. I had just made that assumption. Maybe they were older. It's kind of not the point, I said to Lina, if he's attractive or not. If he's going to treat you like that, it more or less eclipses everything else. I looked over at her. Don't you think? Are you giving me some big sister advice? 
Lina had that strange, sideways smile going on again. It was like she was somehow both totally innocent and unwholesome at the same time. I pressed my point. Well, what was going on? Why did you get out of their car? Her smile disappeared. I saw the same look come into her eyes that I had seen when I'd first helped her up from the grass. It was something hard, unyielding, assessing. She said, I wanted to see what they were capable of. I slowed the Roadmaster through the last curve before Beach Boulevard met Summit Drive at the top of the hill. Lina didn't say anything more. Finally, I said, shaking my head, I don't really know what that means. You were testing them? I pretended to be afraid. They were drinking, passing a little silver flask between them, and then I had some. It was Jack Daniels, I think. I decided to ask them to take me back home, and when Dylan told me to relax and not to worry about anything, Zach was just silent in the back seat. I made a scene and made him pull over to let me out. I was still shaking my head. Why? It's very important to me to find out if people are good or bad. Dylan was on his way to one of them. Lina's voice became brighter suddenly, and she laughed. Then you interrupted, but it's okay. I like this outcome better. I'm having a great time with you instead. Oh, she said, go left at Summit. We came to a stop at the lights for the intersection of Beach Boulevard and Summit Drive. A right turn would take us to Summit Estates, which was where I had assumed we'd been going. Left would go nowhere, really. There was only one thing up here in that direction. The light turned green. I didn't accelerate. I guess I was processing what a left turn meant. You can go, Lina said. It's green. I thought we were going to the estates. Nope, she said. She pointed to the left. I live over there. At the mansion? I said, hearing my voice rise, incredulous. At arson? Yes, she said simply. Okay, I said, turning left. Lina said, You pronounced it right. Arson. A lot of people say it wrong. Arkine. Nope. I tell them it sounds like the word arson. Like setting things on fire. Tess, guess what? It's almost funny. You're nearly out of gas. Needle on E. You can't stop. Don't stop. Have to. There's nothing anywhere around here. This road goes northeast for miles through the Santa Monica Mountains, winding along sides of hills, through forests that feels like there's no end to it. You'll make it. There'll be a town. The gas station will be open. Just keep driving. It's starting to rain. The windshield wipers barely work, have to slow down as the road veers through tight curves carved around walls of rock, then rows of massive black pines that writhe in the wind. I can't keep my mind here. It's happening over and over again. When I blink, I see him. I see the knife. The rain makes a white screen in the headlights and the movie plays out there, projected from inside. The man in the bomber jacket. He came toward me, knife in his hand. I was down on one knee. I was shaking, shaking so bad all over, with fear, with anger. Tears forced themselves out of my eyes. I tried to stand up and I lost my balance, tripping forward onto my hands and knees. Then I straightened back. I was kneeling when the man came up to me. My hands had found each other, pressed themselves together. I looked at my hands. I could have been playing, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door. Are you praying? He said. I could feel the tears on my cheeks, burning. He held the black-bladed knife in his left hand, pointed downward, and the length of it was never still. It moved back and forth as if it was tasting the air. I don't want you to pray, he said breathlessly, stuttering. I, I don't want that. It's not right. Please don't do this, I said in a tiny, pleading voice, a desperate voice. He shouted a word, howled it, drove it out of himself with a force that made me wince. No! It was a shout that distorted his face, made him double over as if he was about to be sick. His glasses flew off, shooting down into the underbrush around us. When he righted himself, his face was splotched red, his eyes bulging, a vein on his temple quickly throbbing. He kept on shouting at me, Don't speak! You can't speak! Don't say a word! 
Anger took hold of me suddenly. I started to get up from my knees, almost involuntarily. I had opened my mouth to shout something back at him. Fuck him for doing this. Fuck this fucked up situation. But immediately he was on me, over me. The edge of the knife moved in under my chin, pressing at my throat. So sharp there, it felt like a thin line of fire. A wetness seeped out below it, but I knew he hadn't cut me. He just held the knife to the skin, death expressed but suspended, and the edge of the knife was so sharp it had drawn blood just the same. Tess Bellamy, I heard him whisper. You're even more beautiful like this, close to me. I closed my eyes. I heard myself crying hard, sobbing. He took the knife away from my throat. Why do you want me to hurt you? He stepped back. I opened my eyes. He was rubbing his right hand across his face. He made a sound, a moan. You know I don't want to hurt you, Tess, he said. I couldn't hurt you. I love you. He pressed his hand against the side of his head. All at once he screamed another scream, a sound that flayed the air with rage and agony. Then silence replaced the echoes of his screaming. He drew in breath after breath. His head was bent forward. I saw his shoulders begin to shake. He was laughing. He said, I think you better run away. I rose from my knees. I ran. Are you a virgin? Lina asked me suddenly. We were approaching the gatehouse that stood sentry at the entrance to the grounds of the mansion. The immense house itself was far back from the high iron fence that faced the road. You could glimpse it through the woods that grew wild on most of the land of the estate, screening the home from outside curiosity. Um, I said in response to the random question. You can tell me, she said. I won't say anything to anyone. Why do you want to know that? I am, she said, a virgin. I've never even kissed anyone. I wanted to break the car to a full stop, tires squealing. I looked over at her. Her brown eyes were dark, intense. I think I realized right then that her eyes were the most expressive thing about her and that her laughter and sideways smile could not be trusted. I said, you're being serious? I'm always serious. You've never had a first kiss. No. She shrugged. Were you going to have it with that Dylan guy? I was. She nodded. Yes. I guess I was going to fuck him. I thought we were on a date. Then he picked up Zach. She considered this. Does that mean they thought they were both going to have sex with me? Um, I said again. You know what? We're here. I turned into the drive next to the gatehouse. There was a security guard on duty. He came out of the gatehouse as I pulled up and rolled down the window. He was an older man, moving slowly. His stomach strained the polyester of the security company's uniform. His chin was jowly as he bent down to the window. I could smell on his breath the ham sandwich he'd had for dinner. Hi, Hank, Lina said to him, leaning across from the passenger seat. To me, she said, that's Hank. He's on nights right now. Hi there, Miss Lina, Hank said to her, smiling. This is Tess, she said to him. Tess is driving me home. You can let her in. Hank nodded at me. It was getting dark out, so I might have misread his demeanor, but he did not smile at me. In fact, I thought he was giving me a look that was openly hostile. I half expected him to ask me to step out of the car, yet he simply moved back from the driver's side window and said, Have a good night, Miss Lina, Miss Tess. He went into the narrow little gatehouse and closed the door. The gate began to slide open in both directions from the center. While the gate opened slowly, I rolled up my window, cranking the handle around and around. Lina watched me with detached curiosity, as if she had no idea what I was doing. I'm not, I said. Not a virgin. No. Do you have a boyfriend? She asked. I bet he's nice. I don't. But you did? Not really, no. You've never had one? Not like a steady boyfriend. Not all loved up and everything, no. Well, I found myself saying, 
I thought I was in love once, but it didn't work out. How old are you? Lina asked. Nineteen. How about you? Seventeen. And you've never kissed anyone? I drove up into the estate. The front drive went past a parking lot that was just beyond the gatehouse. It was empty, but there were several golf carts parked all in a row to take people up to the house, I assumed. Then it split and made a circle, left and right around a marble fountain that looked like it belonged in Rome, some kind of cherub shooting an arrow into the back of a fleeing, naked, busty maiden. You can go right up to the house, she said. She turned to look at me, serious once again. I've been sheltered here, she said. I'm sure you've already come to that conclusion, or something like it from what I've said to you tonight, how awkward I am, like I don't talk to many people, which is just the truth. I haven't been allowed to go to school, not like my brother. I've had private tutors for everything. I really do kind of hate him, my brother, because of this, not that it's his fault. My family is, well, they're old-fashioned, let's put it that way. It's old-fashioned to let your brother go to school, but not you? I must have sounded shocked. Something like that, yes. I'm not sure I understand. Of course not, she sighed. I don't even understand sometimes. So what I'm going to say in the next few seconds before you let me out in front of the house is extremely important to me. I turned myself toward her. I saw that her eyes glistened with emotion that was only barely held in check. I'm going to be in trouble, a lot of trouble, for what I did tonight. I thought it would be worth the consequences, and I was right, but not in any way that I anticipated. I don't have friends. I don't really know anybody that well, including my brother, my father. Our home is formal. It's cold. She paused. A tear fell down her cheek. I really like you, Tess. You're special. I can tell. I want to see you again. I want us to be friends. I know I'm weird. I can't help it. But I promise I'd be loyal. I'd be really good to you. I'd be great. A great friend. Stop it. I interrupted. I couldn't suppress a laugh. You don't have to convince me of anything, Lina. No, she said softly. I pulled the Roadmaster up in front of the house. Arson. The mansion was incredible. Vast. Marble plinths in parallel rows flanked the wide steps that swept up to a massive front double door made of dark, heavy wood inlaid with designs of dizzyingly intricate nested circles and what looked like snakes eating their own tails. I mentioned before that I spent every day in high school being made aware of how different I was from other girls, sometimes painfully so. The few friends I had were like me, estranged, left out, left behind. I knew one of my own when I saw her. And something else was going on here. Yes, Lina was unusual and awkward, and I was probably getting into something with complications I couldn't foresee— but I felt right then that her intense and desperate appeal for my friendship was absolutely some kind of cry for help. Lina's hand was on the rest between the front seats, reached halfway toward me. I placed my hand over hers. I'll pick you up after my shift tomorrow, I said, and we'll figure out somewhere to go and get completely wasted. Her stern expression dissolved into relief and happiness, Fuck yeah, she said. Then she took in a deep breath. Just one thing first. Which would be... what? I said uncertainly. Turn the car off and come out with me, right now, up to the house. Before we do anything else, you have to meet my father. Majo, begin journal entry. The men came out of the dark as I walked from the diner to the B&B. &B. Three men, two in front and one that was quiet behind me, but I knew he was there. I could feel their intentions, the sharpness of their thoughts, scraping violence out of the future. I shook my head, 
surprised and chagrined that I had been discovered so quickly. And yet, there was something gleeful in me, a freedom found in the simplicity of the moment. Inwardly, I spoke words of challenge, invoking my will. The ground where I stand is all that I am. Come move me from it. On the left in front of me, the first man removed a pistol from his coat. He had slicked back hair and a long, sharp nose. The man to the right had close-cropped stubble for hair and a thick mustache that was a few decades out of fashion. He flicked his hand down and a tactical baton telescoped toward the ground. There was the sound of movement, footsteps rushing, from the man who thought he was unseen behind me. Are we talking about this at all? I said. No? You sure you want to do this? No reply, and Mustache surged forward, the baton cocked back for a blow to the lower half of the body, my right knee. The fact that Slick Hair hadn't just shot me out right in the head meant either these men intended to subdue me and take me somewhere, or they had orders to keep this quiet. It's probably a combination of both. From the start, my hand had gone into the right outside pocket of my suit jacket, fingers closed around Crybaby. I took the switchblade out, thumbed the catch. The stiletto blade flipped open with a whisper and locked, extended. Mustache came at me with surprising speed. The baton whipped around. I sidestepped, punched Crybaby up into his armpit, biting deep, yanked it out, and stepped back. All of this was noiseless. Mustache dropped the baton and pressed his hand into his armpit. He coughed, blinked furiously, fell to his knees. Blood began to pour out of both of his eyes, two red rivers that streamed down his face. At last, he toppled forward onto the ground in front of me. I know, little wing. I know. It's violent. In this part of the story, I started right in the middle. That's where the action is, though, and sometimes that's where the beginning has to be. Otherwise, what kind of a storyteller am I? Also, it happened last night, and it's right there in the front of my mind. However, let me go back. Let me snap the puzzle pieces together just a little. You already know I spent that night, two nights ago now, in the motel room at the Evergreen, dreaming. I woke up at midday the next day, and I was still so damn tired, so spent. I should have known right then what was happening. It was the sorrow coming on. But I wasn't thinking clearly. I was still half submerged in the deep echoes of all that dreaming, only half awake. Gary Cooper checked me out of my room. It was like he had never left his little niche behind the front counter. I could have sworn he was sitting in exactly the same position. Wearing the same clothes, watching the same black and white movie on his little TV. It was a pleasure, Mr. Majo, he said to me as I left. Come and stay with us anytime you're in town. Always a discounted rate for a man of your stature. I walked out to Beach Boulevard. I didn't know where I wanted to go. I was exhausted. I could have stretched out anywhere, in a doorway, beneath a tree, behind a garbage bin. Just close my eyes and lie there. I had a few dollars left, enough for a meal somewhere maybe, but if I wanted another night in a hotel room I would have to generate more cash and I didn't exactly feel up to it. A BMX bike leaned against the side of the convenience store in the strip mall on the corner of Beach and Leaf. A young man sat cross-legged in front of the bike, facing the sidewalk, looking down at a large piece of paper which was unfolded and spread out on the grass. As I approached, I saw that what was unfolded was, in fact, many sheets of loose-leaf graph paper all taped together to make a larger surface area for what appeared to be some sort of map. The young man looked up from the map and looked at me when I stopped and stood over him. I can only blame the onset of the sorrow for the fact that I hadn't noticed until right then he was wearing a Mexican wrestler's mask. We did not speak to each other. At that moment, I thought little of it. He held a pencil in one hand as if he had just finished drawing something on the map, which was oriented so that I could read it. 
while the lines of the streets on the graph paper were bold and straight, and the houses, buildings, and trees had been drawn, in pencil, with some skill, the words written next to each destination and place of interest were illegible. Jumbles of backwards, upside down, even imaginary letters that were either some kind of personal code or written there by someone troubled in their mind. I saw that one place on the map had a description written somewhat legibly, though misspelled, and the words crudely formed in the manner of a small child having only begun to learn how to write. It was a drawing of an old house with a garden out front, two stick-figure women with skirts, one with very long hair and the other with short, spiky hair, stood in the garden, holding hands. Jenny, with one end, and Karen's bed and breakfast. All at once, the young man snatched his map up from the ground and folded it over and over into a thick bundle of stacked pages, which he stuffed beneath his shirt into the waist of his jeans. He snatched up his BMX bike and went down the street without looking back at me. I had seen on his map that the bed and breakfast wasn't far from where I stood at the corner of Beach and Leaf. I smiled a little. There were one or two things I could probably do in order to find lodging there. I pressed the button to flash the lights at the pedestrian crosswalk on Beach Boulevard. I crossed the street. At the last minute, I was forced to leap to the far sidewalk as an old station wagon bore down on me without appreciably slowing, then breaking much too late. At the wheel, a young woman with long, straight black hair waved at me, contrite, mouthing the word, sorry. I could have worked a spiteful end of magic to make her truly sorry. It would have been easy, like a shrug of the shoulders. I almost did it, but I couldn't risk drawing more attention to power not after traveling from L.A. to this town. What I needed to do was focus on finding shelter. My approach to the bed and breakfast was one of reconnaissance. I walked the blocks uphill on beach and turned to the left onto Mayfair Street, lingering at the corner where I untied and retied my shoes, having a look at the house which was three properties down on the main street. A white sign on the front lawn read, Mayfair House Bed and Breakfast. There was a pleasant flower garden occupying a good portion of the front yard. The house itself was quaint, painted in bright yellows and blues. Had a welcoming front veranda where wicker easy chairs with throw cushions were an invitation to put the feet up and unwind. I doubled back to an alley behind the houses on Mayfair Street, coming up to the B&B &B from this vantage point. A small garage had been converted into a storage and groundskeeping building next to a concrete pad where guests could park. There was a blue Volkswagen Golf parked there now, the only car. A low fence separated the parking area from a landscaped yard which contained an elegant koi pool and a sizable stonework patio arrayed with metal tables and chairs that gave the impression of a sidewalk cafe. There were blue recycling and black garbage bins in a row along the side of the old garage. I began to go through them, looking for something I could use. Then I heard some movement in the yard. I sprang around to the back of the garage. A woman came out from the yard and closed the gate in the fence behind her. She was dressed in gardening coveralls, dark at the front from kneeling in the earth, that hugged her full figure and round stomach. Her short-cut hair was nearly purely white, not dyed that color, but naturally grayed to pearl, which might have been the only feature that dated her otherwise ageless, unlined face. She looked around, surreptitiously. She produced a cigarette and a lighter from the pocket of her coveralls. I narrowed my eyes. A cigarette is an easy thing to interfere with, even at a distance. Only a tiny spark of power is required. The woman put the cigarette between her lips and saw at once that it was bent and broken, as if it had been crumpled accidentally in her pocket, though when she had taken it out, it had been whole. When she plucked the cigarette out of her mouth to have a look, it fell apart in her fingers. My cue. 
I made a slow approach so that she could watch me come up the alley toward her. I couldn't know what Anpenpan made of me in her eyes, but she was regarding me impassively. Her eyes held curiosity. A faint smile wasn't unfriendly. I tipped Anpenpan to her as I drew close. I noticed some bad luck there, I said. With that cigarette. But lucky for you, I have a few left in my last pack. I'd removed a rumpled cigarette pack from the Hello Kitty backpack earlier. I held it out now for the woman, one of the remaining two cigarettes in it, slipping out for her to take. She did. She read the label on the pack. Miso. I've never seen this kind before. The label depicted a man in a suit staring at the sea, standing on a beach where washes of tide swept the sand. They're Algerian, I said. The woman lit the cigarette. Its smoke spread out around us, lingering, faintly sweet. A few moments of quiet. I stepped closer to the woman and looked directly into her eyes, speaking slowly, clearly, with authority. My name is Gabriel Majot. I am your friend, an old friend that you haven't seen in a long time. We met many years ago and worked together, becoming close acquaintances. You trust me completely. I told you I was coming to visit you here, but you have forgotten because you've been so busy lately. You would love to have me stay here as long as I like. I plucked the cigarette out from between her lips and crushed it on the ground with the heel of my shoe. It was only partially burned down, but its power was spent. The woman blinked a few times in rapid succession, then looked at me. Her wide eyes startled, caught in a conflict of confusion and clarity. Karen, what's going on here? There was another woman standing with one hand on the gate at the back fence. She was noticeably younger than Karen, taller, willowy, and graceful. She was dressed in a light blouse and long skirt. Her auburn hair was tied into one thick braid that went down past her waist. I felt an acute intelligence in her gaze as she regarded me. Karen shook her head as if her thoughts had finally resolved. She put a hand on my arm and smiled warmly. Jenny, this is Gabe. He's finally here. To me, she said. Took you long enough. Jenny came through the gate, hesitantly. Who is this? I held out my hand. Gabriel, I said. Pleased to meet you. I apologize for not knocking on the front door, but I saw Karen out here in the alley as I was coming up Beach Boulevard. I thought I would surprise her. Karen was looking at Jenny, strangely. It's Gabe. Did you forget he was coming? Jenny shook my hand. She smiled, but it was strained. Plainly, she was assessing the strangeness of the situation. I could already sense the dynamics of this couple's relationship. Karen was accommodating, voluble, possessed a strong personality and a love of making people happy. Jenny was perceptive, decisive, judgmental. I don't think you ever mentioned that he was coming. Jenny said warily. Karen sighed. You know what? You're right. I'm so sorry, but I think I forgot to tell you. She groaned. I can be such an asshole, but Gabe knows all about that. We worked at the firm together, oh, ages ago now. The effect of my second last Merceau cigarette was working through her thoughts. She was creating our story. I grinned at her. A long, long time ago. It really was, wasn't it? Karen laughed. Jenny was watching us interact. There was nothing in Karen's behavior that suggested I wasn't exactly who she said I was. Karen's hand had remained on my arm affectionately throughout this exchange. Well, Jenny said finally, why don't we get you settled in, Gabriel? We're lucky there's only a few reservations on the books in the next little while. I went up between the two of them through the gate and into the yard. Along the back fence, 
Canary yellow daffodils rose above a dusting of snow white hellebore. How long were you planning on staying? Jenny asked. Karen answered. He's welcome as long as he wants, Jenny. Then she strode ahead up the path along the koi pool. Let me sort out a room for you, Gabe. Jenny stopped by the side of the pool. She looked at me intently. It's nice to meet you as well, though I have to say it's a bit of a surprise. Awfully sorry about that, I said. Not your fault. She paused. And you worked at Granger and Gamble with Karen? That's right. What kind of law did you practice? Family. Jenny nodded. Interesting. Karen called down to us from the house. Gabe, let's get that suitcase in your room and let's get you a drink. You must be starving as well. I'll get some dinner going. Jenny gestured at the backpack. I had been carrying it in one hand. I can take the suitcase for you, if you like. No, I said. It's very heavy. I wouldn't dream of letting you lift it up those steps. We made our way between the metal tables on the patio and went up a few steps into a covered back porch that had been built onto the house. Karen was waiting there, beaming at us. I'm so happy you're here, finally. How long have I been trying to get you to come out and stay with us? I shrugged. A while now. Karen went into the house ahead of me. Come on in. Here it is. Our pride and joy. Mayfair House B&B, if you can believe it. I followed her inside. Jenny, trailing. It's very nice, I said, truthfully. The interior was decorated with impeccable taste. What stood out was an abundance of original artwork taking up nearly all of the available wall space, giving the house a vibrancy that helped transform it from being simply someone's home into a place where guests were welcome. You've got the best room, up that staircase and down the hall, last door on the right. Karen clapped her hands together. I'll make us some food. Karen, I said softly. If it's all right with you, I'll actually pass on that. I happen to be very tired, and I would appreciate the opportunity to have a late afternoon lie down. Oh, she said, not disguising her disappointment. I was hoping to catch up, Gabe. Jenny intervened. Let him have a nap, Karen. He's tired. I promise we'll talk all night long, I said. Just like old times. All right, Karen said. But you'd better keep that promise. I turned away from the couple and headed up the staircase. The upper floor was decorated with even more artwork, a profusion of different styles and media that provided a kaleidoscope of colors and forms. There was a single shared bathroom at the top of the stairs and three or four small bedrooms along the short hallway. I found my room, went in, shut the door, sat down on the bed, rubbed tired eyes that felt like bruises in my face that would never heal, slipped off and penpon and put it gently on the bedside table. I wouldn't need to wear it all the time around Karen and Jenny. Their versions of me would remain constant now. I shook my head, laughing to myself. My tricks had found me a place to sleep, but it was going to take some work to keep up the forced illusion of friendship. A knock came at the door, followed by Jenny's voice. Sorry to disturb you already, Gabriel, but I just wanted to have a quick word, if that's all right. I went to the door of the room, opened it. Of course, Jenny, I said. What's on your mind? This may come across as a little rude, she started. But I feel it's important to get it out of the way, if you know what I mean. Go ahead. Right at that moment, I felt a tremor come into my hands. I clasped them together to stop it. Well, it has to do with Karen. You knew her a while ago, back when she was a lawyer. And I just think you should know that a lot of things have changed since then. I felt the tremors spreading, my arms and my shoulders. I squeezed my eyes shut, forcing them open again with an exertion of effort. Jenny had taken no notice of what was happening to me. 
She pressed on with saying what she needed to say. Obviously, you're used to things being a certain way with someone, and when you meet them again some years later, the changes you see in them might take some getting used to. What I'm getting at, and I'll just come out and say it, is that I saw you were smoking with Karen in the back, and it's a serious thing for her health. She is absolutely not allowed to smoke cigarettes at all, ever. Oh, she said then with sudden alarm. Are you all right? I had no choice but to sit down on the bed in the middle of her speech. My shoulders were moving back and forth as I forced air into my lungs. I gripped my knees with hands that quivered uncontrollably. I started to cry. No, I wept. At first, I tried to choke it back, hold it in. Then great, desperate sounds heaved out of me as if ripped free from some place within. Tears ran freely from my eyes. I sat on the bed and cried as if there was nothing left of me except for grief. Jenny stood in the doorway of the room and watched me, mortified. Finally, she sat down next to me. I continued to sob. She leaned into me, put an arm around me, and I rested my head on her shoulder. You're okay, she said softly, repeating. You're okay, it's okay. It's okay. The sorrow casts an enduring shadow. It is perhaps the greatest work of magic completed in history, a curse that affects men like me in different ways. I've known some who languish into a malaise that lasts weeks, months. Others who strike out in anger at their loved ones, often tragically, and its reach is inescapable. There simply is no becoming what I am without suffering from it. And there is no feeling like it. An alien thing, a darkness from outside the boundaries of what makes you who you are. It overcomes all defenses and takes residence, becomes for the duration of its tendency a second self, a tyrant self, commanding oblivion. As far as the sorrow went, I was fortunate. It made me incapacitated. It plunged me into depths of emotion without abandon, but only for a brief time. And when it left me, I was completely free of it. I have been hated by others because of this comparative ease of my passage through this affliction. Jenny still held me. Already I could feel the sorrow lifting. I was realizing belatedly that I should have recognized its onset in the last few days, the encompassing fatigue I had been feeling had always been a sure sign that the sorrow was imminent. This is a good place to be, Jenny said. It's safe. Whatever's wrong, we'll talk through it. Whatever you're running away from, Karen will know what to say, what to do. She's amazing like that. I took a handkerchief from a suit jacket pocket, wiped the tears from my face. You're good, Jenny said, releasing me, moving apart, looking at me. You're good now. Thank you, I said. That was intense, she said. I laughed. Jenny laughed. Suddenly, we were both laughing hard, laughing hysterically, I threw back my head and the laughter cascaded out of me. Jenny grabbed her sides and then suddenly slipped off the edge of the bed to the floor. I let myself fall back onto the covers. I felt as if I had reached a state in which tears and laughter were inexhaustibly inseparable. I covered my face, laughing and crying, into the lines on the palm of my hand. You're listening to Dark Heights by C.D. Miller, starring Dion Graham, Julia Whalen, and Neil Helligers. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Realm, listen away. Dark Heights is created and written by C.D. Miller. It is produced by Haley Wagreich and executive produced by Molly Barton. 
Audio production, sound design, and editing by Amanda Rose Smith. Original music by Chris Miller. <laughs>